want to say a special welcome to our panelists um, that um, are academic experts on public diplomacy and foreign policy at Lund University and they are all with, the, with us today. Um, now it's my great pleasure to, to introduce to you um, the speaker of this morning, uh, Professor Nancy Snow. She is Professor Emerita of Communications at California State University Fullerton and Distinguished Professor of Public Diplomacy at Kyoto University of Foreign Studies. Professor Snow has written and published extensively on propaganda and persuasion in relation to issues of war and um, power and democracy. Uh, and among her publications, we find works such as Information War, Propaganda and American Democracy, Truth is the Best Propaganda, and more recently, the Routledge Handbook of Public Diplomacy and the Sage Handbook of Propaganda. Today, she's going to give a presentation that is connected to her ongoing research of rethinking public diplomacy through a gender and feminist lens. Um, so I'm delighted to welcome um, Professor Snow to give her views on gender perspectives on public diplomacy and foreign policy. So over to you, Nancy. Thank you so much, Cecilia. Wanted to thank Lund University and all of those who are tuning in now who are part of strategic communication, public affairs. That's been my world now for too many decades. Uh, <laughs> I finished my PhD in 1992 in Washington, DC at the American University School of International Service. I think I'd like to launch uh, from that transition of the academic classroom to working in a foreign affairs bureaucracy. Uh, at the time, Bill Clinton had just been elected president. And as you all uh, may have heard, uh, of course, he had as his spouse, Hillary Clinton, who ran for president in 2016. And uh, she's been a figurehead of gender and feminism, not only in the United States, but around the world. But when, after I completed my PhD, I worked at a foreign affairs agency in Washington, DC, known quite well to those of us who work in the public diplomacy community of scholars. And it was called the United States Information Agency, USIA. Overseas, it was often referred to as USIS, US Information Service. I didn't know until I began to work there that USIA and its subsidiary, the Voice of America, were defendants in a sex discrimination lawsuit for excluding and manipulating over 1,100 women in hiring and employment practices in the 70s and 80s. Now, mind you, I was working at USIA now in the post-Cold War era, 92 to late 94. The, the nature of their complaint, of their lawsuit, uh, was that the Voice of America women were openly told that they weren't being hired because listeners preferred male over female voices. Male voices sounded more in command on air and women applicants were told this in job interviews. Qualifying exam results were actually manipulated in order to hire men over equally qualified women, which may seem archaic, right? But it isn't. Uh, I live uh, part-time since 2012 in Tokyo, Japan. And in 2018, a mere three years ago, Tokyo Medical University admitted altering entrance exam results to favor its male applicants and to keep women applicants to under 
despite the women outperforming the men at larger numbers. The university management was said to be worried that its female graduates would leave medical practice early in order to raise a family. And so they wanted their graduates to pursue medicine over a lifetime. So of course this garnered headlines from across the world, but those of us in Japan were used to such headlines. <laughs> I don't think in Sweden you'd be used to such headlines. Just to mention the USIA VOA case again, it was finally settled during Women's History Month in, in the year 2000. So this was a case that had spanned 23 years to come to fruition. And it remains the largest award for an employment discrimination case in the history of the Civil Rights Act. It was over half a billion dollars at the time, which also made the Guinness Book of World Records. <laughs> I'm sure they created a new category just for that. So once I got to USIA, you're going to hear me today talk much more personally than I normally do in a lot of my scholarly writing. But I've reached that point in my career where I'm beginning to tell my story as it's interspersed with my professional background. And again, I was very excited to have practical work experience. I had the FUD, I had the PhD, but I always thought, and I was told, you don't wanna just teach, you wanna have some experience that you can bring into the classroom. So I was very excited to be in the foreign affairs arena, but I very quickly learned that USIA was overwhelmingly uh, women uh, supplied. I mean, it was, it was mostly women working at the agency and telling the story of foreign affairs, of U.S. foreign policy to the world didn't mean that we could analyze foreign policy. We were not involved in foreign policy making. That's what the big boys were doing over in Foggy Bottom, and that would be the State Department. So I was in a program called the Presidential Management Fellows Program that began in 1977 under Democratic President Jimmy Carter. And it had quite a competitive selection process. And so when I got to USIA as part of this fellowship, we were allowed to rotate to different government affairs agencies. The idea of this program was to get people with at least a master's degree and some of us with a PhD to work for the federal government. And so they wanted to expose us to different agencies. So I was able to get a rotation over to the State Department. And here I, was, I had a lot more to do. I worked in the Bureau for Refugee Programs and I had mostly male colleagues, and I was serving as a liaison between the State Department and Capitol Hill and taking very prominent uh, folks from the various international non-governmental organizations to meet with uh, members of Congress on, on Capitol Hill. So I did that brief rotation, but USIA wanted me back. Uh, to the agency because the, the sort of open secret was that the morale at an agency that doesn't get to actually make policy uh, was much lower and they had higher turnover and they had the, the cloud of the class action lawsuit. And so um, they very quickly kind of shut down any rotations that I could take. And I realized that if I wanted to really make a difference, perhaps I had to go outside of Washington and go, go into uh, teaching and doing scholarship. Uh, one of the uh, people I later really identified with quite strongly was Edward R. Murrow. And Edward R. Murrow, of course, had been a, a legendary broadcaster with CBS. And when Kennedy was elected in 1960, Murrow became his pick to head up USIA. But Murrow was very 
uh, upset about not being included around the table where security matters were decided. And there's a very famous Murrow dictum that we often use in public diplomacy. And it's a quote that Murrow allegedly said at that time following the Bay of Pigs debacle. He said, if, you want, if they want me in on the crash landings, I better damned well be on, in on the takeoffs. I didn't say that too well. If they want me in on the crash landings, I better damned well be in on the takeoffs. So my point related to gender here is that my experience over these years has been that women are not only not in on the crash landings, but we're often not even in on the takeoffs. Uh, earlier this year in, uh, in Japan, in the lead up to the Tokyo Olympics, some of you all may have heard that the Tokyo Olympic Committee chairman had made a disparaging remark about women, a sexist comment. So he quickly, uh, yeah, here we go. Here's the chat. You may want to tune into the chat right now. Uh, do you want me to answer that? <laughs> we already got, <laughs> I was already told, I was already told that uh, gender is so threatening. So, um, so as I said, the uh, uh, when earlier when he had to step down as the head of the Tokyo Olympic Committee, then the LDP, the leading party in Japan, said, OK, we're going to have to do something that will look good. And that it, they, they appointed women to the executive committee of the LDP. But it came with a caveat. Because the women were appointed, they would not be allowed to speak around the table. I believe that they allowed them to write on a piece of paper and maybe hand it in, but they weren't allowed to use their voices. So again, this has been often the condition of gender in international relations. I don't have enough time to go into how my experience was at uh, the School of International Service. It's not a, it's not any kind of a um, really sort of a, a kick at my school. It was a great school. But at the time when I entered graduate school to study international relations, diplomacy and IR were in the context of what men do and what men talk about. So our main text, no surprise, was Hans Morgenthau's politics among nations. And if anybody has seen my book and my uh, latest book with Nick Cole, The Rutledge Handbook, in my chapter on rethinking public diplomacy in the 2020s, I say there that as much as we in public diplomacy like to think that we've really made a difference, we haven't quite gotten to the level of having a core text like dialogue among nations to really operate at the same level of import of Hans Morgenthau. Uh, but you know, my experience early on was that if you really wanted to be a change agent, you had to go mix with the boys. You had to go where the boys were talking. And if anybody has read Catherine Graham's book, it won the Pulitzer, she was the head of the Washington Post and became a legend in journalism. Uh, she was highly criticized at the time when she took over because, of course, she had no experience in the news business. And in fact, her father, who had bought the Washington Post, had handed the paper to her husband, not to Catherine Graham. And Catherine Graham said that her experience growing up in the 20th century was that the women went one way. They went into the parlor to talk about soft issues, you know, to ask about children and uh, to share tea with each other, not to get into politics because that was a dirty business. And the men went into the other room and Catherine Graham said she always wanted to be in the room with the men, but she wasn't allowed to go in there because she was the spouse of an important man in Washington. So, so much of gender really and gender research is very much interspersed with personal experience. And 
you know, it's it's fascinating. This is my first trip to Sweden, and I must say that when when we are talking about gender in Japan, we look to the Nordic countries as our great model, as our aspirational goal. But my understanding is that everywhere in the world, uh, you still have a lot of um, con contested definitions of gender and feminism. You have a lot of debate. You have a lot of pushback. So there's really no nirvana place that I know of where people are truly equal and we don't have the kind of pushback that we often experience. So I, I wanted to um, mention that when I worked at the State Department, one of the people who really got me interested in the concept of women's empowerment and humanitarianism is a woman who just died a few, few years ago and her name was Sadako Ogata. And at the time in Washington, D.C., uh, there was Hillary Clinton and her famous speech in Beijing, China. That came a few years later in 1995, I think. But the uh, Sadako Ogato held the position. She was the head of the office of the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. And it was Ogata who left a lifelong indelible impression on me. And 20 years after working at the State Department, I was able to finally meet Ogata in 2015 at the United Nations University in Tokyo. And she really had no interest in my sort of fangirling. <laughs> she got right into a back and forth conversation. It was all about sort of what we knew and um, you know sharing with each other. And I ended up, when she died, writing, writing about her is really somebody who is able to, yes, she's a woman, she's a woman leader, but also be a leader in her own right. And Ogata was very clear that when it comes to gender, you, you know, in her case, she didn't really make much of a fuss about her gender, even though she was a statesperson of, uh, you know, the highest from Japan to be a woman who had aspired to that position was really unheard of in the 1990s. But she always downplayed that and she would just address people as equals. And she was such a wonderful role model in terms of almost transcending the gender hangups that we often have with each other. Now, another point that I wanted to make, because in the interest of time, I am not only somebody who studies public diplomacy, but I try to live the life of a public diplomat, and that is to have back and forth and to have the interaction and not just talk at you. But I did want to say a, a few words about uh, IR as a subfield of political science. It was then in the 90s, largely defined by geopolitics and national security with states as primary actors on exclusively masculine terms. Women were not feature players, not even in a marginal sense and marginalized people were not even present. Uh, we read about what men thought, theorized, and declared, be it the clash of civilizations thesis of Harvard Samuel Huntington, the end of history proclamation of the of Rand's uh, Francis Fukuyama, or as I mentioned earlier, the Ursprung scholar of foreign policy, Hans Morgenthau, and his Hamiltonian-inspired realism theory. The understanding of men having automatic agency while women look on is something that didn't just pop into my head for the first time in graduate school. Every woman uh, has experienced being sidelined from authoritative discourse. And I had an experience uh, writing to an MIT scholar of political science in 2017 about possibly coming there as a visiting scholar and of course, he recognized my specialty in my CV and in my opening letter. His response was prompt, but discouraging. And he said, thank you so much for your interest in coming to MIT. And fortunately, 
Due to limited space, we're not able to extend an invitation to visiting scholars who are not engaged in a project with MIT faculty. And as I read your background and research interests, I do not discern a research fit with any of my colleagues. There is no affiliate of our center who works in the domain of public diplomacy. We are rather more a bombs and rocket shop with recent additions of scholars who do nuclear weapons research and grand strategy. And when I read that email, I thought of Jan Tickner's comment from an interview in 2016. And I think this, this quote will underscore why we need more gendered perspectives in public diplomacy and diplomacy and IR. And here's her quote, she said, and of course the subject matter that is privileged in IR, national security and war is very masculine. Security studies is a field in which there are still few women and one in which women feel particularly marginalized. Terms like high and low politics and realism versus idealism are highly gendered because I'm kind of getting outside the quote now. When you think about one versus the other, it's a dichotomy. You have to go in one direction or the other. And she goes on to say, looking at discourse through gendered lenses helps us see the world differently. Now that's a very interesting quote because before I came here today, just a few days ago, I was in Riga, Latvia. And it was for a board meeting of a journal that I'm part of on strategic communications. And the editor in chief at the board meeting said, you know, it's interesting, there's so many women in strategic communications. There's so many women in, of course, a lot of the communications industry to begin with. But what he bemoaned was the fact that women were not at the top level in terms of decision-making. So as he was speaking, I thought of my experience working at USIA 30 years ago, that women were not the decision makers. Women were the message carriers. Women were like in Japan, when I went over on an exchange in the 90s, we'd go to the Ministry of Defense, Foreign Affairs, wherever it might be, and the men were around the room and they would be briefing us. And then at some point there would be an interruption and in would come the women probably with master's degrees from Yale pushing the tea and coffee cart. That's a very strong visual image that, that kept with me. So I've really had now this feminist or gender journey now 30 years in the making and I would say that it goes back to my graduate school days, and it really has come to this fruition. And I will tell you in my remaining remarks before we go to open the floor here, that I am here on a research grant. I'm really not here on a speaking grant, but I'm glad to be speaking to you all today. And my research grant is a, sponsored by the Swedish American Bicentennial Fund. And in my proposal, I explained that I wanted to really sort of uh, dissect this feminism and foreign policy. Of course, I'm aware of it. It's been written about. But I really wanted to kind of come here in person now that I had the ability to do so. And I'm talking to people. I'm talking to people in a cafe. I'm talking to people checking me into a hotel, and I will start to talk about feminism and foreign policy. It's a, um, it's my own methodology of just sort of what do people think? What are their impressions? And I realize that it's not all great. It's not all working out the way that it's been proposed. And is part of the problem, perhaps, that feminism and foreign policy has been put in that box of idealism that is not that is really undernoted, underappreciated in IR and political science. It's like those ladies again, figuratively speaking, off having tea in the parlor. Is that what's going on? Well, I think that this article that I have in front of me, I'll just reference it from 
Karen Agastam and Ann Towns, the gender turn in diplomacy, a new research agenda. When I read this, I thought, gosh, what's the date on this? And it was 2019. And as I read it, the first sentence says, diplomacy has traditionally and formally been a domain reserved for men only. And then they go on to say that as of 2014, 85% of the world's ambassadors were men. Men are still overrepresented in diplomacy. And so, so much what, what I was reading, encountering in this text in 2019 was a deja vu to what I was experiencing in the 1990s, that women were still invisible in foreign policy, in security issues, I don't think it's really changed that much. So we often talk about women's issues and for sure Japan does that in the form of womenomics, but it's seen as an adjunct, it's an add-on. It's like, okay, yeah, we've got to talk about the women too. <laughs> but then they go back to just talking about what they regularly discuss. So it's not an integrated part of the framework in which we begin to do research and dialogue and as you can see, even today, it's a contested concept. If you put gender or feminism in the title of something, uh, there's going to be pushback to that just to have a little fun with it. But I think I'll just stop there because uh, I'd like to go to some questions and go to the panel. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nancy. That was a fascinating talk. And thank you for sharing so openly um, about your uh, own experiences of working in the foreign services. Um, I'm sure it will spark a lot of questions from the panelists and I, I already saw a hand rising. Uh, Jesper, would you like to pose your question? Yeah, uh, thank you very much, Professor Snow. Um, I'm having a cold, that's why my tone is so weird. Uh, I hope you can hear me anyway. I sure thank can. You very much for, thank, you. thank you very much for, for your speech. Uh, it was really interesting. Um, I'm a professor in strategic communication at the department here. Uh, actually, I took a undergraduate semester at American University in 1996. Ah. Oh, that's wow. My, uh, that's my fame. And then I went back and stayed in Sweden. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I was just going to mention, uh, I think it was really interesting. I just thought about the, the next step in your presentation. What do you see as, as uh, a strategies to... Uh, countering this this uh, situation and some kind of solutions oriented uh, uh, ideas and so on. I'm a little bit interested in that because I guess you have some some good ideas also to change the world. Thanks. Well, I'm so glad you asked and I would almost think you were a plant because as I ended my formal comment, I thought I really haven't offered any solution, but I was hoping somebody would ask me about that. There is a concept that I have been working on and it's at the very beginning, but going back to the gender turn in diplomacy, as I was reading this wonderful article, it struck me that when we talk about women in diplomacy, we often talk about women at the top, so the ambassadorial level, and, and certainly that's legitimate to talk about how many men hold ambassadorships. But that's certainly not enough because that's all part of a hierarchy. And of course, the power is centered at the top. So in my, in my work, what struck me was that I have uh, several exchanges in my background and uh, more than more than a few. And I noticed over time that there is this phenomenon, particularly in Japan, where I'm doing this study a little closer. There are so many more women, 60 to 70 percent in the Japan case, who are uh, engaged in study abroad. And there is a bit of this sort of feminization of study abroad taking place in many parts of the world. So that's not unusual. But with Japan, you will, uh, when I go around and I talk to a lot of people and I did a study on uh, Japan's public diplomacy in the world. And so I met a lot of higher up women uh, in government and in industry. 
And I could almost answer the question, but I would ask them, did you go abroad for part of your education? Oh, of course I did. And then if they were at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the government sent me to Harvard or Yale or they came back um, with that overseas experience. But I thought, here are gender diplomats. Here are women who are really shattering stereotypes about this sort of old fashioned image of the Japanese, the very idealized, you know, female. Uh, and, and I've I've heard it said that it's the, you know, like the most feminine woman is the Japanese woman and she can cook and clean and do it all. And so these are women who are really making their mark, but the spark seems to be leaving their country of origin and finding themselves not only gaining freedom, but of course, gaining a certain emancipation vis-a-vis -vis language. So of course, we were talking in English. I've never formally studied Japanese. And they are becoming global citizens, citizen diplomats, but also I would argue, argue gender diplomats. So I think in terms of transforming the dialogue, we need to kind of get these people who've had this overseas experience to talk about how it has shaped social identity and these intersections of who they are and who they think they can be or what they can do in the world. Because the women I've encountered in this process, in this research study of the gender diplomat, are women with a lot more confidence, women who are much more likely to speak up in a seminar, not to hang back. There's nothing wrong with being an active listener but they can hear their voices and they're finding their voices. And because their numbers are so much larger than those few women diplomats at the top, I think you do have the possibility of from the grassroots going up to affect some change by getting people to open up more men and women, all types of, all walks of life to talk about their experience. There's real value in experiential knowledge because it's your truth. Like my truth is sharing what I experienced at USIA in the State Department and in graduate school. Now somebody else may have had an entirely different experience, but that doesn't take anything away from my experience. So. When I've talked about gender diplomacy in East Asia, and I've given a few lectures in Korea, uh, one in China last year, and then ongoing in Japan, there is this, it, it, there's this awakening. It's like these women have never even thought about their roles in this, in this sense of being gender diplomats. And it, and it reminded me that kind of aha moment reminded me of when I was a kid, 10 years old, being told by a teacher, have you ever thought about being a writer? It changes your whole point of view of how you see yourself. So I am doing this work in gender diplomacy, which is related to enacting roles and doing even training in these roles so that you're comfortable talking about gender the way that we see a lot of training going on now to get people comfortable talking about other intersections of race and ethnicity and religion. Does that answer your question somewhat? Or yeah, you follow up? thank you very much. That's a good question, good answer. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, we had a question from Malena Rosian Sundström. Um, Thank you very much for this uh, inspiring talk. Uh, oh, I was won wondering uh, what you think about uh, uh, the possibilities of other states uh, launching their feminist foreign policies. Uh, today we have five states uh, and uh, uh, on the one hand, we have an interest from certain states to have a feminist foreign policy. And then on the other hand, we have this uh, uh, polarization and pushback for women's rights and so on. So how, how do you think about this? Hey, I'm all for it, but I would also say read the room because 
remember, if you go back and uh, you read or you uh, probably read the speech by Hillary Clinton, remember the headline that went global. It was before all the social media. It was when Clinton said women's rights are human rights. Wow, you know, what a concept. So that's a quarter of a century ago. So imagine if we were to just start talking about feminism and foreign policy, just integrating it into our language. But it's not something that maybe you can carry around and you know bring up with everybody like I do, since I'm in Sweden and this is my topic. Um, but you really have to understand the context of where people are coming from. And you know what we do in propaganda, well, <laughs> I should say in propaganda studies, in order, if you want to counter the other's propaganda, you have to really study the propaganda of your opponent per se. So with feminism and foreign policy, there are wonderful articles about it. And I love reading the reports and this more perfect world that we all believe in. But you have to go to those who are most resistant to it and understand them. Where are they coming from? They may really fear this change. What will this mean about the differences between men and women? Will we live in an exclusively feminine society? Will I lose my masculinity? You know, those are questions you have to address. And I was very pleased a few years ago, I talked to Sasakawa Peace Foundation, which not everybody in Japan works with, but they, they have a lot of money that was left by, the, by Mr. Sasakawa. And they do a lot of work in developing countries on gender and sustainability. But they also hired a researcher uh, whom I met, and he does masculinity studies. And he was doing research into that because there was real concern in Japan amongst men, and I think this is somewhat global too, of being left out of this new push towards women's empowerment and women in STEM. And we talk about gender, we really mean women, you know, and advancing women. So he, I'm really interested in the results of his research. It's been a year to year study, but they just now are beginning to publish these studies. And these two would be helpful, masculinity studies, looking at, well, what, what are men saying, you know, in focus groups? And not everybody's comfortable talking about this. These are very sensitive issues. But in terms of what Sweden did in really creating the high water mark, um, there was a woman I knew in New Hampshire. My first teaching job was in New Hampshire, Arnie Arneson, and she ran for Congress. She ran for governor and uh, she worked at the legislative state house, but she didn't get to the higher levels. And when she would speak, she was a wonderful speaker. She would get this question about why do you keep running? You know, you've lost repeatedly. And she said, I run because it pushes the door open for the one who's going to run after me. So it may not be my race to win, but even in this context of pushing the, the needle forward, that we this should be even, you know, in a way, feminism and foreign policy or equality, wanting people to be more equal, it should be something that isn't contested, but it's going to remain contested. And I think getting more, not only states involved and state actors, but non-state actors to share both their, their fears, the challenges they have, maybe it wouldn't work in certain contexts because there's fear that you know men and women are in a certain uh, kind of archetype. They're, they're, they have their different roles in society and you don't wanna upset that apple cart. Uh, but the more that you dialogue with people outside of the center of the Nordic countries, I think the better off you are. Because even in the article, in the gender turn in diplomacy, at the end, they really emphasize we need to get away from these center points where we're all sort of talking to each other, where we're already very familiar with it in the US, in the UK, in, in the Nordic uh, part of the world and get into other regions and talk to people who are not part of this conversation right now.
otherwise it's going to be just forever associated with Sweden and those other four countries. And it'll seem like it's a very static concept. Thank you very much for that question. Thank you. And now we had uh, Elsa Hedling. Thank you very much for a very interesting talk. Um, Thank you. I thought, I thought it was very interesting how you talked about the gap between telling stories and being involved in policymaking and how you um, thought of that gap as a gendered gap. Um, but I haven't thought about that before and I thought that was interesting. Uh, but I was wondering then if as public diplomacy has gained more momentum um, and more visibility recently, do you think that the status has changed? Has, has the, the um, USIA gained morale? Um, and my second question also on status, um, you talked a lot about women as change agents and women's agency and, and now just uh, lately on gender diplomats. So again, how do we go about increasing the status of that, that form of public diplomacy? Sure, thank you so much. To the first one, I should update you all, and this will tell you a little bit about morale and also about the conundrum that USIA had. Uh, when I worked at USIA, I left there in late 94, and five years later, it was no longer an independent foreign affairs agency. It was merged into the Department of State. So there is no USIA officially, but the public diplomacy arm is now in the State Department. And there's a lot of debate about whether or not that really worked out well, because when that happened, it was two years before 9-11. Uh, and when at that moment, there were many saying we really need, we need a storytelling agency more than ever. But my hang up with telling stories, I should add, and I get into this in my first book in Propaganda Inc., which was the subtitle is Selling America's Culture to the World. But the hang up I had about telling was that it, it, it sort of um, assumed more of a one way, you know, telling our story, our official story. And to me, even then, right out of grad school, I thought, well, the official story is only one part of the story because there are stories being told all the time and shared. And we need to tap into those and get a landscape picture of a place. So that uh, that's sort of, uh, and you, you were uh, right to pick up this sort of uh, image of the women as kind of the messengers. You know, I'm, I have an essay that, that'll be in the uh, place branding in public diplomacy journal, the special issue on gender. And I describe the women's role as sort of the, the person entering the room and whispering into the ear of the obviously important person, you know, the decision maker. And that was sort of the way that USIA, many of us felt that we were, we were underappreciated. And so ultimately it merged into the State Department and it had no constituency because as a propaganda agency, we could not legally speaking uh, propagate uh, uh, propagandize the American people. But of course, as I travel around the world, everybody tells me, you do the best job, the US government propagandizing your own people. Anyway, that's another story. So as to gender diplomats, and I think what you're, you're asking is how to make that a more visible part of public diplomacy. Yeah, I mean, that is a a great uh, question. And what I would like to see is I don't want to just do this research in isolation. I would like to see a whole network of us around the world to start using this language and not again say gender and diplomacy, because you end up putting these concepts into separate boxes. And we still, in terms of how you picture a diplomat, I think the image that comes to mind is still often a man and a tall man. <laughs> and so with gendered diplomats, the more that we address this, imagine with young people who are newly returned from overseas, 
with so many of our exchange participants, educational exchange participants, they return and they're eager to do something as a follow-up, but they're, they're not asked to do anything because they're often seen as, as doing the overseas experience as sort of a feather in their cap and maybe it will enhance their CV. But if you start talking to them about, in fact, you are a, what I've always told my students, you are a public diplomat. If I tell you you're a public diplomat, you're gonna, you're gonna actually physically respond differently when you hear that because now you realize you have responsibility. You have a certain authority, responsibility to not only the polis, but to society. It changes a whole outlook in life. And I think the same is happening just in a small way, but it will grow if you talk to uh, these mostly young women, but I talk to young men as well. But as I say, it's, it's many women who go abroad and I address them. Do you realize that you, you are a gender diplomat? You are showing a face of Japan that is unexpected because as you grow in confidence and as you find your voice, this is not what people expect from Japanese women. They have this stereotype of uh, subordination and silence. And so you're smashing that stereotype. And that is so uplifting to them to see themselves in that light. I mean, it's always been very well received. Now, if I were to call it feminist diplomats, that would be different <laughs> because that's much more of a contested term, especially in that part of the world. Many of the young people say, well, I wouldn't say feminism, but gender they're comfortable with because they can recognize that. They're, they're much more, that's a safer zone for them to be in. But they certainly get when I talk about the stereotypical image of a Japanese woman, they get that right away because they've grown up with that. And they've had to deal with that, not only with foreigners who come to Japan, but also when they go abroad. And you know what, too, with the gender diplomats, there are a lot more women in leadership positions who are also enacting these roles of a gender diplomat, and they can then serve more that mediating mentoring function with these younger ones coming along. So I'm just advocating for this as a public diplomat, and I'm gonna see how far I get, but it, I'm kind of hanging my hat on this concept of gender diplomacy and gender diplomats. Thank you. And then we had a question from Ekaterina Jukova. Hello, Nancy, and thank you so much for your presentation, especially I appreciate your uh, practical experience because you make me think of a question that I'll ask now. Uh, what is your take on the concept of a female patriarch or a woman patriarch? I'll explain what it means and why I ask this question and whether you have encountered one in your career. Yes. You probably heard there is this concept, Ed, women and stir, like with pepper and salt in soup and stir. <laughs> and why does this exist? It's because in the liberal Western tradition, and the, this is a dominant one, liberal Western feminism that we find in foreign policy, in UN, in all the conventions, is that we don't change the system, whether it's capitalist system, new liberal system, post-colonial system, etc. We have the same system and we try to add women into the system. So some women try to survive in this system by becoming patriarchs, meaning becoming like men, internalize yeah. male behavior. And that in turn creates inequality between women because yes. not all become men patriarchs, not all internalize it. So whether you have encountered that and what do you think about it and how can we deal with it? Thank you. Oh, that's terrific. Actually, I mean, add women and stir. I, I like that. And also I think of the old image, you know, coffee, tea or me, right? You know, like flight attendants. And I didn't mention earlier that uh, the, you know, women in diplomacy, women in the foreign service, uh, the article goes into that again. Uh, if you were single, 
you could stay in the Foreign Service, but as soon as you got married, you had to give up your career because you now had to serve the needs of your spouse and become, and, if, and there's a lot of case studies of diplomatic spouses, as you know, almost all female. I haven't really, as far as I know, had the experience of the female patriarch, but I think you, you raise a good point here. And I think that's one of those pushback points too of what kind of a society do we want? Are you saying that empowering women, if we want to get them to move up, they're just going to be contributors to a patriarchal domain with which we have a number of uh, issues, uh, including the, the, you know, the pillaging of the environment and, you know, not living a sustainable life. So I, I think part of it is that, um, you know, my growing up, I have to admit, I didn't have women role models. I only had men from graduate school to even my career choices. It was always men giving me advice. It wasn't women. So it's, it's sort of hard for me to give you any experiential knowledge about this. But I, I take this, uh, I, I take it that you are studying this, right? Well, yes, I'm studying. I have a bit of experience of gender studies in my previous uh, life. And now <laughs> I'm also working on feminist foreign policy, but I read a lot of feminist literature and what is feminism and what is economic empowerment, just adding women into the labor market like tools to increase growth. So I always keep thinking about having the same system. So what do we actually change? Well, you know, let me direct you uh, that um, I've written a lot about the Abe uh, Shinzo uh, regime and administration and followed by Suga and this whole womenomics uh, era and, you know, making women shine to use his expression. But my, uh, there are many uh, feminists in Japan who have said, this is just contributing to the existing problematic structure, which we have here because Abe was touting Women in the workforce, which always, you know, is great on people's ears. Oh, yeah, yeah, we need more women in the workforce. But what people weren't noting was that he was also saying, and you need to get married and you need to reproduce because we've got a real fertility problem here. So there was this enormous pressure put on women, which then impacts their ability to even want to get married and have children because now they're even more stressed out. And guess what? Many of these women have said, I don't buy into womenomics because I don't want to be like the men out there. The salary men who are, you know, some of them dying on the job. That's a real problem in Japan. Karoshi, which is, you know, just dying in the workplace because people are so overworked. And women carry a disproportionate weight, of course, of the domestic life and the child rearing in Japan. So they were not taking in what Abe was proposing, but I thought he was the worst messenger for womenomics. Like who gave him that idea, you know? Because the more you read about it, he's part of a, of a uh, regime of the far right, you know, in Japan. So, you know, adding a lot more women who are emulating that won't necessarily change the system. So thank you for your comment and your question. Thank you. Um, we also had a question from uh, Martina Smedberg. No, we had a question from Isabel Carlson. She was muted, Martina, that's why. And I just unmute, sorry. Thanks a lot for your interesting presentation. I just had, uh, during your presentation, um, a walk back in memory lane, uh, because I used to work in Geneva during Ogata's time at UHCR, but I was oh. in And I remember Ogata pushed for a lot of Japanese women, young women, to come to Geneva and work for the UN. So I knew, I mean, we were all young at the time, and we were hanging around and planning our futures and talking about it. And was you, as you say now, with, with reference to uh, Abe, I think that pressure was already more intense at that time, because once they took the leap out of the country, 
and went to uh, an American um, university or to the UN. There was no way back for them. Absolutely. It was yeah. very odd back in the Japanese society. Um, while we others coming from the Nordic countries, we could choose and go back and come back to the UN again, or we could skip a couple of years and do something completely different, but they had not that chance. And that was the pressure from, from the Japanese society. So it, maybe it hasn't changed that much, uh, even with uh, Alba. So that was more of a, a comment. Thank you very much. And again, uh, the I've talked to a number of people, Glenn Fukushima, who's uh, very involved, uh, American Japanese, but he had been the trade representative at one time. And it was Glenn who first told me about this problem for a lot of the Japanese companies because they were promoting the men to go abroad to their affiliates and the men couldn't really handle uh, having to do, you know, figure out where they could get their uh, clothes washed or, you know, make their meals. They, they were running into this feeling of sort of helplessness because they were outside their, their comfortable domain. And Glenn, uh, who went to Stanford, he said that he was at a Stanford seminar with all these CEOs and they were saying they were very worried that uh, they weren't training the, the women, enough of these women to go abroad because the women had more of the built-in flexibility that came out of the study abroad. But there is a lot of worry now of this sort of brain drain because these women, when they're being asked, my friend who's one of the higher ups at Sasakawa, he says he sees these very capable Japanese women overseas and he asks them, are you ever gonna go back? And they say, no, to a person, they've said, no, I won't. It hasn't changed. So I think that, you know, you make a, this is again, this is that dialogical sort of understanding kind of weaving through what do we know to be true? And maybe it's not a quantitative study, but I think the more that we talk to people and really archive this, we'll get a clearer picture of how much has really changed over these decades. Because at the time of Ogata's death, I didn't think there was enough being written about her really in tribute to her. And I think it was because she challenged Abe even to the very end. She said, what are we doing changing the constitution? You know, we've had this peace brand and that's what I admired her her continuity, she really stayed true to that. So I called her boots on the ground with a heart, you know, cause she would go into those refugee villages and, you know, really get their eye to eye level and talk to them. I mean, I'm getting goosebumps now just to have met her and talk to her. So it was thrilling for me. So I'm, you know, I'm envious of the experience you had. Well, uh, my experience was at WHO and there was a male, um, director from Japan, not the same experience. <laughs> we'll leave it at that. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks a lot. You're welcome. Thank you. And we also had a question from Isabel Carlson. Thank you. Thank you very much for a very interesting talk and also all the great questions and discussions we have now. And one thing that I'm still um, observing or, or like wondering about is who are the people who talk about these issues and who talk about that this is a problem because um, a few years back, for instance, I was in, in Lund um, listening to the initiator of uh, the He for She campaign. I don't know if you are familiar with that, but uh, sure. for those who are not sure. um, that um I think it started out as a really small campaign of, of United Nations women about uh, this idea that um, we need those, those people who are powerful today, which is mostly men, to help women rise so that one day we all are equal. But it was really interesting because to that talk, it was mostly women in the audience. And I also noted now today here, uh, when I look at, at the participants, it's a lot of- The sorority, right? <laughs> yeah. And I mean, while on the one hand, it's, it's really great to see that, that we are all so engaged in this issue and we want to change something. Um, I still wonder 
um, I mean, before you said uh, we should talk to those who are resistant towards uh, or understand this, them. You can't. You got to read your audience. Oh yeah, exactly, exactly. But how can we? What what more can we do? Like to to actually get in touch with. You know, I mean, I, I, I find it a little bit hard to, to formulate yeah, no. uh, the question, but, but I think you, you understand what I mean. I do um, understand it. And I'll tell you that, uh, you know, I've been in Japan since 2012 and uh, Abe came into office a second time in 2013. And that's when Womenomics took off. And it was women's conferences all over. And I attended most of these. And uh, what what bugged me was that, again, it was all women in the audience. And then there would be one panel on, you know, male champions of change. So it was like, yay, you know, we've got our supportive men here. But ultimately, when I would talk to my group who had attended with me afterwards, we were thinking, well, what does this all really add up to? Because a lot of those women in the audience, they were not on the level of the women and the few men on the stage. So it was still sort of this idolatry of look at you. And, and when I would talk to some of the Japanese women, they, they'd say, oh, I could never be in that position of Kathy Matsui at Goldman Sachs. She coined the term womenomics. And so I thought there was a lot lost in that opportunity. You had sometimes a thousand women or more, but it didn't really get beyond a person standing up, sharing the story or telling about the company and then going to the next person and then they go on to the next panel. It looked good. It was a great sort of facade and it was something that a government minister could point to in a report because Japan also initiated this WA conference, which was the uh, World Association of Women and they would bring in all these elite women to speak. And it was very hard to get in there because they might have Caroline Kennedy when she was ambassador along with the head of the IMF. And so, you know, very, very elite level. And that's why I said in terms of transformation, you need to have a sweeping change really from the ground up and you have to get outside your comfort circles. So, so often with women, this is a comfortable topic to talk about. But it's not going to really change things if we're all kind of preaching to the choir, as we say often, you know, that you, you have to get beyond that. And so that's why I thought with the gender diplomacy, we could address this across the spectrum of gender. It doesn't just have to be about talking to women, but also talking to men who have gone abroad and what their options are. You know, Japan uh, really to this day it, it doesn't get the headlines like it used to, but having a study abroad experience on your uh, CV, not CV, but your resume was a, a real stain on it because it suggested to the Japanese company that maybe you're too global. Maybe you won't fit into the Japanese system. And that's the real uh, and that was noted earlier about these Japanese women going abroad, even back in the 80s and 90s. They were a threat to the system. And increasingly, I think there are young men who are a threat to the system because in Japan, they don't want to be the salary men. They don't want to do what their fathers and grandfathers have done. They want to find themselves, have a sense of satisfaction with their lives and not get on that that horrible treadmill or, you know, that kind of running in the wheel of capitalism and never having enough. They want to have a sense of peace and, uh, you know, stability. And so it's not just something that uh, women are seeking in terms of bettering themselves, but men too want that quality of life. So Japan ha has talked a lot about work-life balance, but we're still at kind of at that level of sloganeering. We do a lot of sloganeering and buzzwords, and that's just not enough. That's always at the beginning, but it didn't work for Hillary Clinton. You know, I'm with her. That was her slogan, and that didn't get her over the hump to become president. So you have to think beyond, and that's where you use a little bit of marketing about, well, what is it 
that they want or need from this, this message. There has to be some kind of action plan that benefits them because you know that's the world we live in is sort of what's in it for me. I mean, if you're just going to impose this change on me, I don't want it. I don't want any part of it. So how are we on time? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, uh, we're good on time. Um, good. Okay. Yeah. I, um, I don't know. I, I can't see any more questions uh, at the moment. Yeah, Malena Rosian Sundström had another question. Please. Um, oh. Yes. <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, yes. Uh, coming back to the feminist foreign policy of Sweden. Uh, since you have lived uh, in Japan, it would be really interesting to hear. Uh, is this a well-known policy uh, in Japan? Uh, no, <laughs> because my colleague Katarina and I, we have conducted uh, a media analysis and uh, uh, now we uh, had two newspapers from Japan included only, and they were also English uh, mm. newspapers. But we found zero articles uh, during uh, a six year time period. So. Uh, yeah, it would just be interesting to hear some reflect uh, reflections from a Japanese uh, perspective. I agree. And I, I think, too, that um, right now Japan is in the midst of uh, electing a new prime minister. There is one woman running, but uh, she, uh, I, a friend of mine on Facebook, this is entirely anecdotal, but um, he wrote... Uh, you know, she's really always harping about gender issues. So she's kind of a one note, you know, Jane. Or <laughs> He was sort of poo-pooing that, that all she talks is about women's issues. But all four of the candidates are LDP. So it's, it's interesting. It's not really changing that much. There is one woman, so she's going to get attention. But to your question about feminism and foreign policy, I think that when I talk to my students and I mostly you know, teach to undergraduates, so some are very young right out of high school, and they would certainly know that Sweden to them is equality. So that, that's sort of how they would picture it. But as I said, with feminism, if I were to sort of lead off with feminism on day one, I might be sort of tagged as, oh no, you know, there's the feminism professor, there's the gender professor. And so I think there might be shutting down of the years. So I, I am teaching media and IR. I'd be very interested in your research because that's something where I could share with them the research that's going on and you present the information as just for your information. This is what is being discussed. So then you're not necessarily telling them you have to be a feminist too. I think they get a little nervous about that. Well, feminism, you know, I, I'm not anti-male. I'm, you know, so they, they, they get a little bit, um, they kind of squirm in their seats a bit about that. So that was something I learned from USIA. We had information and we had advocacy. And sometimes the safer choice was just provide the information. <laughs> Here's a little pamphlet for you. <laughs> And then leave people to their own devices because you can't control somebody's behavior or their attitudes. Uh, we've learned that, you know, you can throw a lot of money at that, but you have to allow people ultimately in persuasion to come to their own self persuasion or their sense that they've come to their own conclusion on their own. It gives them a sense of, of more power. Okay. So thank you very much, Nancy, for, for your, your talk and your time and, and sharing so generously with us uh, your experiences and, and, and ongoing research. Uh, I, I found it fascinating to, to listen to you and also to, to, to the panel. So, so thank you for great questions and to you, Nancy, for delivering the talk. Thank you. Um, I'm sure we will continue this discussion in, in, in other forums about um, yeah, what a, a, a feminist lens of leadership within public diplomacy would look like. But for now, we say thank you and bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.